Howdy friends, and welcome to another episode, number 103. Escaping the Cave, Tonzilla X-Pod, what it used to be called. EscapingTheCave.com's website, Substack is Tonzilla X. Facebook, Twitter, yeah, yeah. How you doing? Record date on this one is February the 8th of 2021. Early morning hours, once again. Does that matter? <laughs> Trying to relate to you. <sighs> How am I doing? I haven't been able to watch the news at all. Spent most of the last week trying to disconnect from it, actually. With some success. Now, CNN is just... There's nowhere to go. There's absolutely nowhere to go. Ever since uh, the Biden slash of color administration took over a few weeks ago, CNN has just been <laughs> ridiculous. Uh, there's this book that I found. I haven't read it yet. Thomas Sowell. I don't really know anything about him, to be honest with you. I do have one of his books. Uh, the Quest for Cosmic Justice. But I saw a book that he uh, had released, I think, prior to that one. Uh, it's directly tied into Joan Didion's um, On Morality. I'm trying to find the name of the book, just getting ready to order the thing. Uh, let me look here. The Visions of the Anointed. Self-Congratulation as a Basis for Social Policy by Thomas Sowell. <laughs> is in the cart. That is going to be ordered as soon as I wrap this up here tonight. But that's what this reminds me of. It, it sounds like everybody, I can't imagine what MSNBC sounds like, but the people over at CNN, yeah, they sound like they're, they have taken up the mantle of the, the anointed ones within the media. I'm treating the ideology that sect of the American binary, as somehow has it, it, it's a, it's been an agreed upon established truth, on which society shall be run. <sighs> now that Donald Trump has been deposed, and a fresh liberal installed, I can't watch it. I've tried to find other things to do with myself over the last week. As I try to figure out if I want to keep doing this podcast or what it is I want to do, I still don't know. I'm not going to be too redundant here. But again, I, I, can, I have this thing here. This was uh, actually something that I put into the computer shortly after uh, the last of the Propaganda Series episodes back in August of 2019. And the next one I was going to do, I have two of them done. They were both from Jacques Lua in the book Propaganda. The one is titled The Conditions for the Existence of Propaganda, The Mass Media of Communication. Conditions for the Existence of Propaganda. He starts talking about mass media of communication, 1964. Once again, this book is written. I have one section already ready to go on that. And then this one. This is fantastic. This is from the chapter entitled The Necessity for Propaganda. <laughs> Quote, the subjective situation. Pages 147 through 160 of the book, Propaganda by Jacques Lul, written in 1964. I have, this is double-sided print now, two, two, three, four, three and a half pages here. Three full pages, so there's six plus one and a half, that's seven and a half pages. And the idea that propaganda is necessary, the need for propaganda, you want it, you love it, you want some more of it. You know how the song goes? I cannot tell you. When I found that, when I read that section, I think for the first time, it really bothered me. That this thing that I'm railing against, this thing that I'm fighting, is, is, is as natural as our left hand. It's what we do. We fancy ourselves as being these authentic truth seekers. It's what we have to tell ourselves. Joan Didion wrote a book, has a great release called uh, We Tell Ourselves Stories in Order to Survive. <laughs> Tyrion Lannister, all that stuff. Narratives. Right? Grand designs. 
these narratives that apply to the out to the external world, but also apply to the internal world, our, our perceptions of ourselves. We lie to ourselves. We delude ourselves. And one of those delusions that each and every one of us probably has is that we are a righteous, truth-seeking individual. Each and every person wants to believe that, has to believe that. You have to come from the, the perspective and the point of view that you are a righteous person on the side of good. Most of us, the vast majority of us, each and every one of us want to believe that. Majority of us will concoct a story if we have to. I made the analogy cancer doesn't know it's cancer. Fanatics, political, religious, murderous, doesn't matter. How many of these fanatics ever thought they were fanatics? How many of these fanatics had not convinced themselves that they were on the side of good. It's a powerful delusion. It springs back to hope. Sausage party or otherwise, it will be concocted. It will be generated one way or another. These are the narratives. These are the things that we tell ourselves. These are stories. And propaganda, at its core, is a political story. It's storytelling. Propaganda is the art of storytelling with an agenda attached to it. And if you look at it from that perspective, and if these people need that perception, need that, that sense of righteousness, need that sense of hope for both their lives and the outcome of their little internal narrative, the story they're telling themselves about themselves, writing the book in our own minds, propaganda fits beautifully. It's perfect. Sell yourself by appealing to their perception of righteousness. If they're on the side of good in a fight against evil, propaganda's perfect. Propaganda is not something externally inflicted upon us. We made it because we want it. We like it. We need it. Reality <laughs> gets in the way, man. We're storytellers. Truth? Collectively? Are you telling yourself the truth <laughs> when you say, I'm a truth seeker, are you really? Are you sure? Are you sure about that? You do have good taste in podcasts, so I'll give you the benefit of the doubt if you say so, okay? Anyway, I think where I was going with this, if I can remember back that far, it's going to be a weird episode. Again, I don't have anything planned out. I'm just sort of riffing it here, but... This thing that I did find just before I cracked the mic was the necessity of propaganda. And this goes into all of the stuff that I was talking about. The rest of this stuff, oh goodness. Talks about creating, uh, filling the individual with anxiety. Frightening them. And how to exploit that anxiety for a directed purpose. So, it's insidious. I remember putting this together. I remember thinking to myself, this one is going to be really, 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 really good. And I never got to it. I don't know how far I am into this podcast, but this is going to be, I think, if I look at this and I do what I did, this is a two-hour episode, I think. But Yeah. Anyhow, not going to do that today. I wasn't really intended to go this way today, but uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about this. Uh, Thomas Sowell, 
Uh, he has this book that I was talking about earlier that I just uh, picked up tonight on Amazon. I have not read this, but the reason that I want to, once again, I'm talking about his book, The Visions of the Anointed, Self-Congratulation as a Basis for <laughs> a Social Policy, Thomas Sowell. The reason I want to check this book out is because it ties into directly into uh, what I was talking about with Steven Pinker and his book, uh, The Blank. Yeah, the blank slate. He talks about uh, utopian and tragic visions, how you view mankind and how that sort of affects your politics, uh, it affects your ideology, which way you, you're going to go, how you see uh, human beings and how you interpret human nature, whether or not you believe in it. Blank slatists don't believe in in human nature. They think that we're all just perfectly malleable. It's all nurture. Nature doesn't play anything. These are the folks who want to scrape everything away and replace most of, you know, this social evolution, replace it uh, with something in their own image. Uh, Utopian people, those who hold the utopian viewpoint, hold utopia in high regards in other areas as well. Now, do you believe in human nature? Do you believe that instinct plays a role The biology, the evolution, all of this, do you think it's passed down in our genes? Do you believe there is something that helps determine who and what we are? Human nature. Do you believe in those things? On the Steven Pinker scale, you would fall under the tragic vision that we're flawed. Right? And uh, Thomas Sowell, but he's got some what he called the constrained and the unconstrained. The constrained version, in his view is the equivalent of the tragic vision that human beings are a certain way. We are constrained by our nature, by human nature itself. Tragic vision. We're flawed. All right? And if you believe what Sowell called in the unconstrained version of human beings, that we are not constrained by that pesky little thing called human nature, that anything is possible. We can become anything we want to be. Then in uh, soul's terminology, you believe in the unconstrained belief, right? And soul says that there's a clash uh, between the constrained and unconstrained belief. That's the, the social war, the ideological warfare, rift. We have a sort of basis itself from that. Much the same thing Pinker said. Now, if I say the phrase... And racism. How you feel toward that idea or the phrase itself is painted most likely by how you feel about human beings. What perspective, what philosophy you adhere to when it comes to human nature. What's your belief on it? Do you believe we're flawed or are we evolving toward heaven? The utopian vision. The Unconstrained Vision by Thomas Sowell. Which do you believe? I'm pretty sure I could separate you out between liberal and conservative based on how you see human beings. And what's happening today is that people who think that ending racism is a ridiculous idea Because it's how human beings are. We like to be around our own kind. We're tribal. I don't know that there's anything that's more tribal than that. And to a species that likes to congregate with its own kind, is there a more obvious way to do that, to express that tribalism? Probably not. That's where I stand on it. Now, if you think that that can be bred out of people through some bizarre process of social eugenics, then you're a utopian. When it comes to human beings, you are a utopian. You, you subscribe to the unconstrained version of this. Now, when taken to the extremes, each of these types of people, the people who believe in the utopian version or the tragic version, vision of human beings, or the constrained, unconstrained, however you want to look at it, when taken to the extremes, this becomes a recipe for fanaticism and madmen both on the far right and the far left. At some point, these beliefs take on something else. You can probably find an example from the right as well. I think you could look at the religious nuts maybe 15 years ago. 
trying to enforce a certain code, a certain morality upon everyone else. Liberals used to hate this shit. When I first got into, into liberalism, maybe around 2003, we hated this preachy shit, man. This puritanism, this moral puritanism. They focus on the family and those other religious nut jobs. Well, guess what? Now you're doing it too. Yes, you are. Surely you are. It's funny how fanaticism is not limited to one side of the political spectrum or the other. Now, by a long shot, it gets too far. It becomes totalitarian. It becomes authoritarian. Both of those things stem from the moralist. The moralist whose narcissistic moral perspective leads to the inevitable fanatics imperative. Narcissistic moral perspective when that becomes the inevitable fanatics imperative. Joan Didion, on morality, a moral imperative. When your belief takes on such self-righteousness, a noxious self-righteousness where it becomes a moral imperative to coerce someone else some way, shape, or fashion as far as their behavior goes, what they can say, what they're allowed to believe, what they're allowed to say, who they are allowed to be. When you take on that sort of self-righteousness, your politics, your beliefs, your personal placeholder for ignorance, your beliefs, they take on a morally imperative texture of overinflated importance and significance where your opinion becomes a matter of good and evil, right and wrong. That's the connection between morality and fanaticism. Being a madman, that's the mechanism somewhere in there is where the post hoc magic takes place. And these folks, these who just simply want to inflict their will upon another group of people, they manage to tell themselves that they're decent, good human beings. And maybe they're just looking for some Lebensraum. That's where it all takes place. That's how you do it. That's how we do it. This isn't some character flaw either, my friends. This is natural. This is our natural state. This is our monkey state. And if we're not careful, we don't monitor these things and have safeguards and checks and balances. If we don't have those things in place, this is what's going to take over. Those things are no longer in place. Those checks and those balances upon the, the lower parts of our nature. They've been circumvented. Not in place anymore. But when the morality has taken on that moral imperative status, again, that imperative through some self-righteous post hoc litigation process becomes justification for coercion. And that's where you become a tyrant. When you start telling someone else what to do and what to say and how to think, how to behave, then you are the tyrant. And that is the inevitable, inevitable iron fist of the collective. Because in the collective, all people must, must participate. And more importantly, cooperate. To do otherwise is social sabotage. And all saboteurs must be purged, not only for the collective's efficiency, but also to prevent the cancer of dissent from spreading. Unanimity demands compliance. Forced compliance. It's coercion. It's the antithesis of Americanism. It's the polar opposite of our foundational myth. That is blasphemous to the cohesive religion. There are antibodies in place couple hundred years worth of them, of individualism. That's the holy war that's taking place right now. That is the holy war. The Middle East has come to North America. These fanatical ideological religions, 
keep radicalizing and radicalizing further and further apart, becoming more extreme, becoming more certain about their morality, the moral imperatives. Let MSNBC or Fox News or CNN inseminate inside of them each and every day examples of their evil and our, our, our righteousness. That's the holy war. It's not getting better. In fact, it's getting a whole hell of a lot worse. I have a significant problem as I try to figure out what I want to do with this show. Spent a lot of this week trying to figure that out. I have a lot of material here. I did write some stuff up other than the stuff that I found. But I found uh, that it was difficult this week to keep my head from going to a place where I could just give in to all of this. There is no safe quarter between the cult compounds. There isn't a DMZ anywhere where I can kind of collect and gather with other like people. The Republican Party is turning into a cult. The Democratic Party is not too far behind. Wokeism is doing the same thing to the Democratic Party that the Tea Party, which became Trumpism, did to the Republican Party. The extremist nut jobs. There are too many of them. And these political parties, since it's a binary, since we don't live in a parliamentary system, since there's only two They can't afford to lose anybody in an evenly divided nation. So a small band of nut jobs can make themselves seem significant enough to where they're not purged. They're not immediately excommunicated from the party, told to go form their own. They're kept within the unit. And the cancer continues to grow. In an evenly divided country, you can't peel off a significant part of your base. Risk them starting another one and splitting the votes. Jill Stein, you remember her? That's what that looks like. These parties understand it. So when you're complaining that the Republicans are doing absolutely nothing about Trump, or Marjorie Taylor Greene, or the Palin want to be out there in Colorado, they can't. There are too many of them. And the Democrats have the same problem, maybe more so. So that far left wing of the party, AOC, who is the bald woman from Massachusetts? I saw her on my television last night and she frightened me. Good God, man. But they can't do it either. So the far left is going to keep yanking them to the left. The far right is going to keep yanking whatever the hell is left of the, the, the Republican Party to the right. There's no place to reside in the middle. What are you supposed to do? And what are you supposed to do? Keep talking to the supposed moderate majority of centrists? (laughs) It might not matter. The centrism thing may not matter. Because we've almost gotten to the point where all centrists in this country are, are disenfranchised. Where you go? Trump dominates the Republican Party. What happens if you're a right-leaning centrist? You have to get in bed with Donald Trump. You have to get in bed with Donald Trump to avoid being crept up on by Joe Biden. Left-leaning centrist, same thing. I have to go occupy the tent with AOC. Oh, joy. How long after we're introduced should I tell her or would I be safe to tell her that I don't give two shits if she was sexually assaulted? I don't give two shits about her trauma the day of the insurrection. It doesn't matter to me. In fact, you're kind of taking yourself out of the uh, reasonable, impartial juror list. We don't put victims on juries. (laughs) Why should we listen to what the hell you have to say about your questionable personal experience that day? These are the people you got to get in bed with. To avoid that side, you have to get in bed with this side, right? Or sleep on the couch. Alone. Well, 
I've had to rethink a few things. Uh, several things, actually. And a few things came to mind this week where I may have been mistaken about a thing or two. First of all, the IDW. I said uh, a year and a half, two years ago, it was in 2019, and I came to the conclusion that uh, since they never criticized, relatively speaking, the right, that they were basically just uh, a propagandist wing for the right because they only attacked the far left. So I figured, well, you're not talking about Trump. You must be, you're kind of like a de facto propaganda wing. I don't want to hear from you anymore. I didn't. I got rid of all of them. Didn't read their stuff for a long time. And it occurred to me this week, as I was sitting here trying to figure out a place for me to land, to plant my posts so I can build my shack, ideologically, it dawned on me why they never criticized the right. Because people on the right are the only ones who are really paying attention here. You think a lot of liberals who agree with uh, cancel culture, all this other stuff, do you think that they're going to the IDW to be enlightened? Now, when they start attacking the far right, who are they going to be talking to? These mythical centrists who don't matter. <laughs> right? The first rule of journalism in this country has nothing to do with source checking or veracity. It's make money. You have to have an audience to be part of the media. The press has never been free. It can't be when it's beholden to subscriberships. When the people who are reading it are doing so partially because they're pleased with the message. So you have to appeal to someone. Wash, rinse, repeat. Potentially, yes, it is a free press, but it's never been a free press. It's always going to be judged and influenced by the court of public opinion. I don't know why I went that far into it other than to maybe point out <laughs> we should take a self-adulation down a few notches when it comes to our press. The enlightened citizenry. That's one phrase I think we can, we can strike. So I'm trying to figure this out. I got a lot of time invested into this. There's a thing called the, the sunk cost fallacy. <laughs> Where if you start thinking, oh my God, I've got so much money into this, I can't justify stopping. I have to put more money into it. That's a, that's a fallacy. Because the money's already gone. To just keep throwing money into it because you've already thrown money into it. Well, that money's spent already. You have to look at it as starting from zero, right? But if I think that this is starting at zero right now, it's like, oh, God, I can't see where this is going. So it makes me wonder what to do with it. Should I just pick a side? I guess is what I'm saying. I just play the game. I have no hope of affecting anything. I'm not going to change anything. And when I look at these sides, the sides of the political, the sides of the political spectrum, one side at this point, well, both sides, both extremes bother me. But I see one side as a more particular threat long term than I do the other. You've been paying attention last year, year and a half. There's one side of this little political uh, holy war that is definitely a lot more tyrannical than the other. One side bleeds its moral imperatives every single day. I was talking to the girlfriend the other day. I'm trying to suss this out, you know, I'm trying to talk to her about it because I, I really, I don't know that I want to go that route. And I was talking to her the other day and I'm trying to figure this out. I'm, I'm trying to get to the, the, the crux of what's going on here. How did I go from being in the resistance in January 2017 to four years later considering doing an anti-woke podcast? How did I get here? A few things happened in the last 49 months. But the biggest thing 
is that I completely understand why people, how people, how 75 million people or 72 million people around the country, how they can look at the Democrats, how they can look at my former comrades and be so disgusted, just so repulsed by the stench, the self-righteous stench of shouldism. You should this and you should that. We're so sure that you should do this that we're going to try to make you. I perfectly understand that. You sound so amazed, my woke flake friends. You, you, You just can't comprehend how people keep voting against you. It isn't that hard to figure out. It isn't. You want to figure out how to do this? I mean, you're going to have to plug your nose and you're going to have to really use a a little bit of of, uh, self-discipline here. But flip over to Fox News during the opinion shows. Don't listen for the factualness and the veracity of the information being conveyed. Oh, no. Listen for the subject matter. Listen to the things that they are railing against. Just topically speaking, do not listen to any of the logic, but listen to the subject matter, the topics at hand. Those are the things that can be exploited because they are pissing enough people off, repelling enough people to the point where they will use that uh, post hoc litigation attorney that I was talking about earlier, the same thing that will take you from being a tyrant to I'm a good person, the same thing, that same post hoc mechanism will take you from, I don't like Democrats, to I actually support Trump. It'll rub all the rough edges off of it, making a nice, shiny, (laughs) brand new stone of political righteousness from that side. You'll be able to tell yourself anything about the pussy grabber. Anything you want. You know why? Because you don't like those other guys. So you're more willing to listen to any bullshit over here because fuck them. And yes, liberals, you do the same damn thing. Talked a few minutes ago about how unanimity demands compliance. Forced compliance being coercion. Moral imperatives. It's a far darker path. A far darker totalitarian path heading off to the left. This point in time than is heading to the right. If I have to choose, that's where I'm going. I'm going to start sounding once again like those IDW folks, like I was back in, uh, I guess, 2019. Except maybe with a little more focus, a little more edge. I don't know. I don't know what to do about the material that I've been focusing on. I just, I'm at the point now where I just feel like it doesn't matter. I could tell you this stuff. Why? <laughs> Why bother? You know what I mean? Those of you, the very few of you, who are interested in it and and really authentically are trying to disengage and disentangle yourself from it, good luck. (laughs) But you already, you instinctively get it, right? The rest of you, I can be more entertaining than that. Plus, I think there's a bigger IDW audience out there. Than uh, folks who actually legitimately reside in the center. I got to question that, man. Where are you at? Why aren't you putting the pressure upon your representatives? Why isn't the pressure you're putting on your representatives greater than the pressure that the wing nuts are putting on them? Why aren't they fearing a you know a, a defection of centrists? At least from the Democrats, Republicans are getting a, a pretty good pretty good dose of that. A bunch of uh, former Bush officials left the party. This week. Because the Republican Party is clearly pledging fealty, future fealty, to Trump. That is his party now. Again, we saw that immediately after this insurrection thing when the the RNC knelt down and kissed his feet. The the entire party is doing that. The sensible ones are going to have to jettison themselves. They're either going to isolate themselves off like Liz Cheney did, or they're going to have to leave, become independents. 
the Democrats, their day is coming. Their day is coming. The same thing is going to happen to that side. I am more concerned about where that goes than I am with what's happening with the Republicans. It's already happened. I think you guys are more dangerous. Long term, narcissistically. (laughs) In this country, whites are the only group, the only group that cannot advocate for themselves, cannot protect themselves, cannot look out for their own interest. Everybody else, every other group on earth can do that except the American gringo. Does that seem weird to you? Does that seem a little strange? Why are you being demonized? Follow the yellow brick agitation propaganda road, Toto. In order to establish a new order, you have to upset the existing one. Yet the dominant demographic in this country isn't allowed to defend itself. The natives <laughs> yeah, in this country... Yeah, you know what a country is, I hope, right? You know that thing with borders and stuff? Yeah, when it comes to the United States of America, the natives, well, we're being colonized. Yeah, we can't defend ourselves. See, that's a little weird. But this is only the case if you choose to believe it's so. You can defend yourself, you can defend your neighbors, you can defend your kids. You're only not allowed to do that if they convince you that you're not. Millions and millions and millions of people in this country understand this. Millions of them comprehend it. Millions of them understand the difference between being a protected species and having equality. Millions of people understand the difference between the word equality and equity. Equality and opportunity or equity and outcome. Millions of people in this country are all for equality, but not at the expense, and not at the expense of their own standing. That's irrational to expect people to go along with that. Why would you expect anyone? You're the ones who are usually complaining about how poor white people vote against their interest, are they? Are you sure? I haven't done an official scientific poll, but maybe their economic interests are subordinate to their social interests. I understand completely. I'm feeling it myself. I am that repulsion, revulsion, that revulsion, disgust. Every time I hear some boy complaining about how he's really a girl and therefore he ought to be on the girls' tennis team, and you hear a gaggle of you, a gaggle of you progressives over there in the park, in the drum circle, Defending that sort of nonsense. All sorts of nonsense. Every time I see people attacked for something they said five or ten years ago, as though it's a fresh capital offense. Millions and millions and millions of people see this. Millions of people understand it. Most of them aren't going to come up to you and debate you, tell you all about it. They'd rather kick you in the groin than have a chat. I get it. I've had to fight this urge. I've been fighting this urge for two years. As I did read something else in the Alul book, that when you abandon one propaganda, <laughs> be careful. You might, you know, get sucked into the vortex of another one. I've mentioned that. I've talked about that. I've had to battle that for the last couple of years. And I don't think that's what this is. I think I said in an episode last year that the real enemy is extremism in my head. I'm an individualist. (laughs) I loathe collectivism anyway. It's the social aspect of it. But I am an individualist. Anyway, I said last year that once Trump was deposed, that I would take a look at things, I, the landscape, See where things were at, see where things were going, see where they seemed to be going anyway, and reevaluate. And I think that's what I've done. I'm like, okay, Trump's gone, at least for now. But right now, they're out of power. They can't really do too much. 
you know, you've got your Marjorie Taylor Greens, blah, 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 blah. She's just, you know, she's filling Trump withdrawal symptoms, I guess, that the news media is having. That's what she's done. She's just replaced Trump. She's now the baddie one. Now they can cover her instead of the Donald. Not too much going on over there. I know what's happening. I know that whole party is going to convalesce around Trump. It's going to be the Trump party moving forward. It's just, it just has to get there. That's where it's going. I know that's where it's going. I don't really care about the far right wing right now. There are some of those right-leaning centrists that I can sort of ally with for right now. As we all despise you, Woke Flake. We're all getting real sick of you. And we got four years to wonder how much influence you're going to have coming from the left flank. You are more of a clear and present danger now. I said that I would... uh, you know, sit there and I'd, I'd, I'd line up and do some righteous battle with you liberals until Trump was taken care of. But the, you know what? I'd probably turn on you later because of what's oozing out of your left tire. And the same is true of you conservatives. If woke them, it's beaten back into the bush. I don't have to reconsider our alliance. So if the enemy is extremism, I guess, <laughs> if you're living in a binary situation where each side is increasingly extreme, I guess the enemy is whoever's in power, whoever's exerting influence, who's ever able to more effectively coerce. Unanimity demands compliance, forced compliance is coercion to force coercion you have to have power and so I guess that's where my focus is another weird episode today I know I know I know I know but I do have the stuff here that I, I I think I will get to at some point because it's really good it'll feel good to get back to the propaganda material I've got other material here too I keep saying this. I am going to try to get another episode out this week. I say it all the time. I almost never do it. I will try again. These episodes are weird. I'm doing some soul searching, my friends. I got to figure out what to do. (sighs) Which direction to attack? EscapingTheCave.com. Tomzilla X over at Substack as well. Facebook, Twitter, blah, 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 blah. Check out all that stuff you like to. Thanks for clicking in. We'll talk to you next time. So long.